Chapter 7. The use of technology in the classroom has gained attention as an issue in education. As our society continues to embrace new forms of communication, networking, and computer technologies, our schools are scrambling to keep up. In this chapter, we explore what teachers should know about technology and its use in the educational setting, which roles technology may fulfill in education, and how those roles may change what students and teachers do in the classroom. Patricia Gonzalez is one such teacher who uses technology in ways to extend learning in the classroom. See, she issues a challenge to her 8th grade class. Where should the next landfill be built in our state? The students are interested in this topic, which they have heard their parents discuss. They start their investigation by reading online newspaper stories from around the state that discuss the controversy. They hold video conferences with environmentalists and elected officials around the state to inform their research inform their research. Then Patricia, Patricia coaches them on the mechanics of using a geographic information system. A GIS, in simple terms, is a collection of electronic tools that translate data into a digital map. The power of a GIS comes from its ability to display several layers of maps on the computer screen at a single time. For example, students can look at a map showing population density and then at another map that depicts distance from urban areas. The GIS tools allow students to zoom in and out of an area as they begin to narrow down their choices for the site. They can then search the GIS database to make sure they will not disturb any historic or archaeological sites. After two weeks of investigation, Patricia's class divides into teams to present their choices. Three sites are offered, and a different group presents the case for each location. The cumulating activity requires students to role play a city council meeting, assuming such roles as city councilor, mayor, geologist, and angry citizen. Two years later, the same students are still using GIS, but now they're in a field collecting water samples near the landfill that was actually built. They are studying how local environment can, af can affect your health. Students meticulously record data into the app on their handheld devices. They will use this data along with the environmental database to monitor the safety of the landfill. Patricia Gonzalez's role in the classroom is far more, is far from the traditional view of the teacher as sole dispenser information. Instead, Patricia functions as a facilitator. She allows her classroom to become an active laboratory where students take charge of their own learning and hypothesize about solutions to problems posed by Patricia. As she circulates around the room, she challenges her students to consider what evidence they will need to convince an area's citizens that their backyards are the best place for the landfill. Patricia is just one reference point that her students must consult, along with online resources, the GIS data, municipal office, office officials, and other students. As this example demonstrates, computers are not replacing teachers. In fact, teachers have an expanded role in this technologically enriched environment, though this role differs from the traditional one associated with teaching. Later in the chapter, we explore in more detail how teachers can use computer technologies to change the roles of both students and teachers. To put contemporary changes in perspective, let's first look at the way technology has affected American schools in the past. Today, people use adequate educational technology with computers, but technology is in more general sense in a more general sense is by no means new to education. In the early 1800s, a technological innovation was introduced to classrooms and had a profound impact on teaching. Although advocates called this new tool invaluable and it was installed in classrooms throughout the country, many teachers ignored it at first. Schools, schools had to encourage the use of this new technology by preparing training manuals with step-by-step -step instructions to help teachers integrate the device into their lessons. What was this technological wonder? The chalkboard. In the old one school, room schoolhouses where students of different ages worked on their own individual lessons, the function of a chalkboard was not immediately apparent. During the 19th century, however, classroom structure began to evolve from a one-room orientation to the graded classrooms we know today. When teachers began to teach the same lesson to an entire group of students, the chalkboard came into its own. The 20th century brought a, brought a variety of technological devices into the classroom, including the film strip projector, the overhead projector, the motion picture, and educational television. Such changes were viewed as so significant that in 1913, technological proponent Thomas Edison stated, books will soon be obsolete in schools. Scholars will soon be instructed through the eye. It is possible to teach 
every branch of human knowledge with the motion picture, our school system will be completely changed in 10 years. Similar, similar, similarly, when microcomputers became affordable in the 1980s, many software products were introduced to do, drill students on basic skills, and some educational visionaries predicted the end of classroom instruction and the end of the teaching profession as we know it. Of course, this forecast turned out to be no more correct than Edison's overstatement. Today, educational technology is viewed as just another tool that teachers can use, rather than as something that can or should replace teachers. Technology supports and extends what teachers and students can do in the classroom. Whether it's an internet archive enriching a research project or a GIS allowing students to engage in real world problem solving. The key idea is that from the chalkboard to the computer, the needs of teachers and students shape the uses of technology in the classroom, not the other way around. Once a technology enters the classroom, the uses to which it is put are affected by what we might call the technology's level of maturity. In education, as in other fields, new technologies tend to go through three stages of application. In the first stage, the technology is applied to things we already do. For instance, when most teachers begin to use presentation software, they initially use it to show text and pictures, which is exactly what previous technologies such as slide projectors and overheads have done in the classroom for decades. In the second, second stage, the technology is used to improve upon existing tasks. To continue the previous example, many teachers now use PowerPoint or Keynote to link to websites, videos, or other slides as part of the presentation. Instead of delivering a linear march through information, these innovative teachers use the technology to branch out in different directions as the topic and the discussion suggest. Ambitious teachers can even use these tools to produce games, quizzes, tutorials, or branching narrative activities. In the third stage of maturity, the technology is used to do things that were not possible in the, in the past. Teachers use presentation tools such as Prezi to present information in a nonlinear style that can be shared with and mutually developed by students in classrooms down the hall or across the globe. In these ways, technology opens up new possibilities for the classroom rather than just allowing teachers and students to do old things in new ways. In keeping this pattern, the role of any technology in the classroom will tend naturally to change as the technology matures. In addition, teachers follow a similar progression as they become more comfortable with various technologies. Teachers who are just beginning to use technology may start with software or apps that are similar to something they already do. As they begin to learn about technology's possibilities, they will move on to applications such as GIS that allow them to innovate. As we examine different technologies, ask yourself at which stage they can be applied and at which stage you would feel comfortable using them. Computer and networking technologies are an integral part of our society. Over the past 10 years, the number of emails sent each day has increased from 12 billion to 247 billion. The number of text messages each day has jumped from 400,000 to 4.5 billion. We've gone from spending 2.7 hours a week online to 18 hours a week. School-age children are using technology at an increasingly higher rates. 80% of 0 to 5 year olds use the internet at least once a week. Two-thirds of eight-year-olds access the internet daily. Teenagers are their most prevalent internet users. 95% of teenagers have access to the internet. Three out of every four teens use a, uses a mobile device to access the internet. The mobile nature of technology on our tablets and smartphones has made technology ubiquitous. Today, over 90% of American adults use a cellular, cellular phone. 78% of youth between 12 and 17 are cell phone users. The cell phone is the most rapid, rapidly adopted technology. The rampant adoption of cell phones has transformative impacts on society. Some have called the cell phone the Swiss Army knife technology because of its versatility. Recording videos, banking online, looking up medical information, and downloading apps are just a few of the most prevalent cell phone uses. The alarm clock app makes the cell phone one of the first things many people touch each day. The cell phone is so deeply embedded into our society that YouTube's news director purports that within one hour of a significant news story, live footage is uploaded to their site. This is made possible because of the prolification of phones that are capable of recording videos and quickly uploading them to social media sites. With the publication of this newest book, Howard Gardner names today's school children as the app generation. Gardner and co-author Kitty Davis contend that youth today are immersed in apps so deeply that they perceive their existence as a menu of apps. 
In the video case, Twitter and first graders, students tweet with pen pals from across the globe to expand the social-emotional growth of the students. The ubiquitous nature of technology has contributed to the boom in social media. Social media platforms have deeply infiltrated our, our society. Social media is a website or app that enables users to create and participate in online communities. The majority of people who use the internet also use social media platforms. 72% of online adults use social media sites, while 80% of teenagers use social media. 82% of teachers report being a member of a social media network. Figure 7.1 illustrates the exponential use of teenager and adult use of social media. It is hard to imagine a world without ATMs, pay-at-the-pump gas stations, social media sites, and cellular, cellular phones. Now imagine a classroom with no TV, no tablet, no phone, and no computer. This classroom scenario is easily imagined because we have all experienced it. Most people agree that schools should prepare students for life in our society. If pervasive use of technology is a fact of life, should the classroom be an exception? The evolution of teaching has also opened up new opportunities for teachers with skills and technology, which are seen as giving candidates an important competitive edge in the job market. Most importantly, the drive to incorporate new technologies into the classroom pre presents tremendous opportunities for students, as the next section described. In the video case, an expanded definition of literacy, meaningful words to integrate technology. Three teachers talk about the importance of using technology as well as the benefits and challenges of doing so. Since the development of the personal computer in the early 1980s, there has been a push to integrate technology into our nation's classroom. The 1983 A Nation at Risk report called for all high school graduates to be able to both understand and use computers. Nearly 20 years later, the No Child Left Behind Act continued to reinforce this notion by stating students must be techno technologically literate by the time they start high school. The federal government went a step further in 2010 when the National Education Technology Plan was published calling for a revolutionary transformation rather than evolutionary t tinkering. Clearly, integrating technology into schools is no small task. Technology pedagogical and content knowledge is a framework that helps us conceptualize how technology is used to help enhance teaching and learning. TPAC is based on Lee Shulman's work on pedagogical content knowledge. As we discussed in the previous chapter, Shulman contends that PCK is a teacher's ability to translate disciplinary knowledge into forms that learners could master. The PCK model calls upon teachers to be disciplinary experts and pedagogical experts. TPAC extends PCK by calling for teachers to use technology effectively as a ped pedagogical tool. In other words, teachers may be skilled to use digital videos in their personal domain, but they must also understand how to use it for effective learning. TPAC attempts to make sense for the complex intersections of content, pedagogy, and technology. Figure 7.2 presents a visualization of how these components interact. A teacher's TPAC is a composite of seven knowledge domains. Content knowledge, knowledge of the subject matter to be taught. Pedagogical knowledge, knowledge of the methods of teaching and learning. Technology knowledge, knowledge of the continually evolving technologies used for communications and problem solving, focusing on the productive uses of technology in daily life. Pedagogical content knowledge, knowledge of the pedagogies most appropriate to teaching to a given subject matter. Technological content knowledge, knowledge of the relationship between specific subject matter and technology. Technological, te technological pedagogical knowledge, knowledge of technology on classroom instruction, and technological pedagogical content knowledge, knowledge of the complex interaction among the knowledge domains. As this framework suggests, classroom teachers must not only know a content-specific technology tool, but also know how the tool should be used in the classroom instruction. Thus, the TPAC framework presents a model for effective use of technology in the classroom by taking into account that instruction must encompass the new system nuisances ac across content areas, pedagogy and technology. We will explore how different technology tools can be used in discipline-specific ways in the following section. As the example of GIS software shows, many new technologies have been introduced into the educational setting in the last two decades. To discuss technologies for education, we must take several different approaches to this topic. First, we touch upon technologies you probably use in your personal life contrasting these applications with what teachers seek to do in the classroom. Second, we organize technologies around specific tasks that teachers and students might undertake. 
third of the group technologies into content specific categories. You are probably familiar with many computer applications already. You use the cloud server to save your photos, social media sites to communicate, and you may use a mobile app to give you driving directions when going somewhere new. When used in these ways, these applications are called productivity tools. They let you accomplish tasks more efficiently than if you had to use a disk, email, software, or a paper map. Teachers certainly use product productivity tools, but teaching with technology encompasses far more. Some computer applications can be classified as cognitive tools when they are used to engage and enhance thinking. For example, a math student can use a spreadsheet by dynamically generating and manipulating graphs to understand concepts such as slope and y concept. Cognitive tools manage information in ways that allows users to think more clearly, creatively, creatively and critically. Teachers can structure students' use of cognitive tools by providing scaffold for their thinking. To extend the spread spreadsheet example, a teacher might ask a student to complete the example on a particularly constructed spreadsheet and then observe the resulting slope and y-intercept. In an English class, a teacher might provide students with a wiki and ask them to collaboratively write a response from the reading selection. Cognitive tools are not necessarily meant to make learning easier. They do allow users to organize information in new ways to evaluate it and to construct new, personally meaningful representations of the information. At the same time, using cognitive tools often requires students to think harder, more criti critically, or more creatively than they might without the tool. Patricia Gonzalez's students, for example, were thinking hard and working collaboratively to solve the problem of where to locate the landfill. Another useful way to discuss technologies for ed education is to consider the tasks that teachers and students engage in while teaching and learning. This task-oriented approach helps teachers concentrate on what it is they want to do with the tool rather than focus on the tool itself. Table 7.1 presents a partial list of these tasks and a tool that can help you undertake them. Note that in some instances, tools may be used mainly as productivity tools, whereas in other circumstances they are used as cognitive tools. As a teacher, you may also want to think about technologies in terms of how they apply to specific content areas. Some technologies, such as sensors and probes, are more appropriate for math or science than for English or social studies. Other technologies, such as social media platforms, can cross disciplines and interweave subjects such as social studies and math. As you prepare instruction for a particular content area, you will want to consider both how certain technologies add depth to students' engagement with the content and how these technologies may be able to bridge content areas and engage students in multidisciplinary thinking. Teachers of many disciplines will find the tools for de developing literacy useful in this section. We examine digital tools being used to teach writing and reading. Although technology has vastly broadened the avenues of expression available to students, writing ability is still highly valued in our culture. Today, many students use writing. Today, many students write using word processors and write in online environments. These tools offer many advantages over paper, paper and pencil. For example, editing is less tedious when you don't have to laboriously erase several lines of text or even start over. Using a word processor, students can easily experiment with dif different sequences for their paragraphs. In fact, students who learn to write using word processors are more likely to revise their work and make more substantial revisions than our students who learn to write without and make more w without the tool. Built-in spelling and grammar, grammar checks is in most word processing software help struggling students focus on their ideas and the keyboard itself avoids the handwriting obstacles many students face. Teachers using newer digital tools such as wikis and blocks to teach writing. Online writing creates a wider audience for students' work that in return motivates students to become more invested in the writing process. A recent survey of middle and high school teachers involved with the National Writing Project reports that the majority of teachers believe that digital technologies such as the internet, social media, and cell phones encourage higher levels of creativity. These same teachers also believe that digital tools broaden the audience and encourage greater collaboration. These, age, these aids are controversial, however, they are not foolproof, and some educators believe they are often a crutch. The same National Writing Project teachers who reported great enthusiasm for using technology tools for teacher writing, teacher writing also report concerns. They note that students are more likely to take shortcuts in writing and write in a careless fashion. 
the teachers expressed concerns over plagiarism and students' understanding and participating of copyright and fair use gu guidelines. Nevertheless, the more students edit their writing, the more they learn about the writing process. In this respect, digital tools engage in enhanced thinking, making them cognitive tools. These cognitive tools can be used across all grade levels to teach writing. Take, for example, a first grade teacher with a class set of tablets. The teacher can select a story writing app, such as Puppet Pals, which provides the environment for students to select a setting and characters. Then they create and record a story that can be saved and played back to them. A middle school teacher may select to use a comic maker that allows for students to write and illustrate graphic novels. A comic maker such as Pixton allows students to upload their comics so that others may read them online. Take a glance into a high school and you may find students creating their own ebooks. Using one of many ebook apps, students draft a story that incorporates text and video. Then the stories are published as an ebook and may be downloaded into an ebook file that can eventually be uploaded to iTunes. The spread of technology has required an expanded definition of literacy. Students are now becoming literate not just in the written word but also in video, audio, in multimedia productions. In chapter three, who are today's students in a diverse society? When we discussed Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, we emphasized that different individuals learn best in different ways. Students who struggle with written expression may enjoy the chance to publish a web page or create a multimedia presentation instead of submitting a traditional five-page essay. Presentation tools such as PowerPoint and Prezi can combine text, graphics, audio, and video to communicate complex ideas. Students can use multimedia tools like VoiceThread and Glogster to create their own interactive presentations or to illustrate and present stories. The current generation of students is the first to have widespread capability of authoring compelling multimedia works using digital tools. Programs such as Movie Maker and iMovie, which are included with the operating systems sold by Microsoft and Apple, allow students to shift their role from a from the role of passive observer to active creator of digital media. Students can use their strengths in expressing themselves while they develop visual literacy, becoming become familiar with valuable tools for the future, and strengthen their ability to analyze and synthesize information. Digital storytelling is a project that can engage even the most retestant students. In digital storytelling, students create images often by taking digital photos and then pair these images with narratives they write and record in their own voice. For students who are having trouble beginning to write, the pictures they choose can serve as prompts to engage them in the writing step. Because students have chosen and edited the images to accompany the narrative, they have greater ownership and connection to their stories. With the introduction of increasingly affordable digital video cameras and user-friendly software, students can even research, direct, and produce their own digital documentaries. Thanks to story authoring apps, students can now create these fr from handheld devices such as tablets or phones. For example, a student might film a Native American elder telling an important story from his or her tribal culture as the culminating project for a unit on storytelling. It is relatively easy to publish student work on the internet, and the knowledge that their work may end up publicly available motivates students to care more about their creations. Many students enjoy publishing or reading web blogs, more commonly known as blogs. A blog is basically a journal that is av available on the web. Another more current approach to a blog is a video blog or a vlog, where students create video journals. A common form of this is through YouTube. Blog and vlog softwares require little tech technical expertise and it's no more complex to learn to use than most email programs. Drill and practice programs were the earliest form of educational software or educational games. First used as interactive worksheets, the software provided feedback to user, users, usually by labeling an answer as right or wrong and then presenting the next task. Now, many programs monitor the student's progress so they do not move on until they have mastered the current concept. As described in the accompany box, many of today's drill and practice programs also feature a motivational game-like design. Drill and practice programs generally increase the fluency of a skill rather than actually teaching it. Many of these are available as software programs or apps. One interesting tool for integrating individualized, individualized drill and practice with whole class discussion are student response systems. These handheld devices are distributed to individual students or to small groups and the teacher prompts students to use their clickers to answer questions posed to the whole class. Students' responses 
are then automatically compiled and displayed for the teacher to use as a discussion point or to shape further instruction. This form of assessment can be accomplished online using tools such as Poll Everywhere, as described in Table 1.7. Students can use laptops and other handheld devices such as cell phone or the iPod Touch to respond. Students and teachers often create graphical representations known as mind maps or webs to demonstrate their understanding of a story or concept. Software such as Inspiration or Kidspiration use these visual learning techniques to teach students to clarify, organize, and prioritize their thoughts. Mind maps can serve as an alternate assessment tool for teachers who can examine the thinking patterns, inform relationships, and even misconceptions revealed by students' diagrams. Inspiration can also be used as a pre-writing activity to help students brainstorm, draft, and revise their writing. Technology can facilitate interdisciplinary connections in a powerful way. Multimedia tools are used across the disciplines, from a presentation on the Depression that includes music of the era and clips from President Franklin D. Roosevelt, fireside chats, to a hurricane project with graphs, images, video clips, and links to the National Weather Service website. An example combining several types of technologies and crossing content areas is the Flat Stanley Project. Based on the Flat Stanley book series, elementary age students around the world use digital tools to share their own experiences and learn about others' experiences. Students mail either a cut-out copy of Flat Stanley or send a digital Flat Stanley to people or classrooms in other locations. The recipients are asked to write about the experience of Flat Stan Stanley visiting them. The stories can be mailed back or uploaded to the Flat Stanley website. Students can also take their own turns documenting Flat Stanley's adventures with them. Teachers may ask students to take Flat Stanley with them on a trip or even home for the weekend. The Flat Stanley app makes it almost seamless for students to take pictures and record stories about their adventures. Using these rich and diverse stories, teachers develop interdisciplinary activities that can make use of a variety of educational tools, both both technological and traditional. For example, students may study maps either on computer or on paper to locate the countries where Flat Stanley travels. Students can also be connected with other children live and ask their e-pals about the weather and local heroes of their region. Students can use drawing software or basic crayons to illustrate their Flat Stanley stories. They use their math skills and perhaps graphing software to chart the miles he traveled. In this project, technology is functioning at the second stage we described, facilitating and enhancing what teachers can do. As the case study of, at the beginning of this chapter showed, technology can allow students to do legitimate scientific investigations on a scale that would otherwise be impossible. Technology enabled Patricia Gonzalez to use a constructive, constructivist approach to education that encouraged her students to build their own knowledge on the basis of their experiences. The, through the internet, students can use an app on a handheld to see what the sky above them looks like at night, to learn about constellations or monitor the regularity of old faithful eruptions through a live web, web camera. Putting these technologies in students' hands allows learning to become an active process in which they do the experiments, draw conclu conclusions, and engage in problem solving rather than me merely reading about an investigation and memorizing their results. In the constructivist approach to teaching, learning is recognized as an active process. Students engage in constructing their own knowledge on the basis of their previous experiences instead of passively absorbing knowledge as presented by the teacher. This approach to instruction celebrates the differences among students instead of continually emphasizing their similarities. Constructivist teachers can find cognitive tools especially helpful. Because cognitive tools do not try to instruct, they do not assume any particular learning style or metho methodology. Using Movie Maker or iMovie to create a digital story is a good example demonstrating these tools' flexibility. The student must bring the goals and the content to achieve them to the tool, and then the tool will facilitate the student's discovery of knowledge and construction of meaning. Note that it is how the tool is used that makes it constructivist rather than what the tool is. Although cognitive tools are excellent matches for constructive constructivist methods, many other applications can be used in a similar manner. As so often is true in teaching, only the students and teachers' ingenuity, creativity, and experiences set the limits for a tool's educational use, not the tool itself. Although the equipment to conduct many of these experiments is costly, there are ways around these 
financial obstacles. For example, most city governments own GIS software and many are interested in participating in partnering with a local school to share their expertise. As government workers did with Patricia Gonzalez, Gonzalez's class, many organizations support collaboration between scientists and schools. For a reasonable, a reasonable membership fee, schools receive the technical support they need and an opportunity to work with experts. Such partners let's let students see how people in the real world do their jobs as well as allow them to participate in, in interesting projects. This section discusses some of these opportunities ranging from conducting sophisticated local research that contributes to an organized database to collaborating with NASA scientists via conferencing technology. Imagine conducting class beside a sh stream behind your classroom and having the technology to collect a water sample. Instantly and accurately find the pH, temperature, and amount of dissolved oxygen in it, and graph the data on the spot. Revolutionary technology in the form of probes, thermometers, and sensors allow, allows this scenario to become reality. No longer are teachers forced to demonstrate stale experiments in the sterile environment of a lab. Instead, schools are moving towards ubiquitous computing in which each, each student has access to some type of mobile computing device to use inside the classroom, in the field, and at home. Students can access rich data sets, perform calculations, and test their hypotheses themselves. Science students today do things like measure ozone and sulfur dioxide levels from the air near their schools or use GPS to be environmental detectives in a simulation to discover the source of groundwater contamination. Much of science education is based on the skill of observation and resources that allow students to visualize abstract concepts lead to greater understanding. The use of both still images and video in the science classroom has been greatly enhanced by digital tools. Teachers and students can go online and download images or video clips of processes such as amoeba reproduction or a lunar eclipse. Processes that are too fast to observe, such as dropping a ball, can be slowed down and students can use time-lapse cap capabilities to capture processes that are too slow to see, such as the growth of a plant. <clears throat> Document cam cameras provide an opportunity for all the students to clearly watch an experiment without having to all fit around a small table. A document camera captures a real-time image, which can be a 2D document or a 3D item, such as a scientific experiment that is then projected onto a screen or an interactive whiteboard for the larger audience to view. Having collected data, students will need to organize and analyze the information spreadsheets, such as Excel and Google Spreadsheets, are widely used tools for organizing data sets, conducting numerical analyses, and creating graphs. Spreadsheets allow users to perform multiple calculations. User users can see all numbers and formulas at once, and any change is immediately reflected in the entire sheet. Other tools extend the capabilities of basic spreadsheets to offer more powerful opportunities for annualizing, analyzing, and visualizing data. Fathom and Inspire Data are two software applications that provide a flexible drag-and-drop interface for combining data, graphs, and formulas. These to tools are adaptable enough that teachers can, with the aid of a projector, work with data sets live as a whole class activity. Geographic information systems allow geographically referenced spreadsheet data, such as information collected with the GPS, to be displayed and manipula manipulated as an interactive map. Teachers often wonder how they can use technology tools to enhance learning. Technology tools can augment learning by providing creative learning spaces. Elementary teachers are doing just this when they use an app such as SAM Animation or to create animated movies about the water cycle. Creation apps that allow students to create their own representation of the water cycle transform the concept of hands-on learning. Middle school science teachers create innovative learning spaces when they use anatomy apps such as Nova's anatomy series to investigate the human body. Students can not only rotate and zoom in on the body, but they can also perform dissections. Anatomy tools such as these bring the research lab to the middle school classroom. High school science teachers can also enhance learning experiences in many ways. One that is particularly motivating for teens is to use Microsoft's Xbox Connect to teach a physics lesson on force and motion. High school students virtually move objects of all sizes using the Connect motion detector. Then they are able to gather the body motion data, use a body-controlled graphing calculator to represent principles of force and motion. Digital resources can be used to promote historical thinking and inquiry based learning and social study classroom. 
Social studies teachers can make use of a variety of technological tools, including online archives and simulations and virtual field trips. Research skills are an integral part of social studies education. Digital libraries and online archives are one way that students use technology in the social studies classroom. In many ways, they have transformed the way students learn social studies in the classroom. Prior to the advent of the internet, Curriculum resources were limited primarily to textbooks or books in the library. Conducting research with primary resources was reserved for scholars, genealogists, or those who had access to archives. Today, research, today teachers and students have access to a plethora of primary, ac, ac, primary sources through online archives and digital libraries. Some researchers claim that these digital resources have democratized the act of doing history. For example, the Valley of the Shadow website contains detailed databases of Civil War era census results, church records, newspaper articles, military records, and letters about two communities, one southern and one northern. Users can investigate the answers to questions such as what was the average number of slaves people held or how did occupations differ in the north and south. The role of the teacher changes from dispenser of knowledge to that of a guide through the archives, helping students learn to ask the right questions and examine the sources critically. In this way, students and teachers construct their understanding of history together. Students use the internet to access other types of information beyond primary sources. Imagine you are teaching a civics lesson and you want to discuss the impact of a new federal policy. Take, for example, national health care policy. Your classroom textbook would not have current information about the policy or its impacts, but students can go online and get information from multiple sources about the policy. They can read about the policy from the federal government website to learn the basic facts. Then students can read about the impact of the policy from different perspectives by reading different accounts reported by various news sources across the country. Collaborate, collaborate, Corroborating information across multiple sources, such as in this example, permits students to understand multiple facets of the policy. It also illustrates to students how the same news story can be reported differently by different news sources. Even the youngest of our school-aged children can access information from the internet in the social studies classroom. The proliferation of videos stored in different online databases make readily available resources to augment learning. TeacherTube is one such collection of videos that are created for classroom learning. For example, a teacher developing a unit on the first Thanksgiving can find an assortment of videos from Native American songs and dance to reenactors describing life for children in colonial Massachusetts. There is so much information available on the internet that teachers' worries have shifted from finding resources beyond the textbook to how to structure online learning. It is essential that teachers carefully design lessons that scaffold students' learning when they are using online research resources. Web quests are one strategy for force focusing students' online learning. A web quest is an inquiry-based learning activity that directs learners in using information from the web. In a web quest, the appropriate tasks and websites are provided so that students can focus on the analysis of information rather than losing time by searching for it. For example, in the King Tut Was It Murder web quest, middle school students take on the roles of medical examiner, reporter, archaeologist, professor, or historian and explore information about the death of King Tut. Using the provided links, students visit websites and then use what they learn to develop a persuasive essay presenting their verdict on whether King Tut was murdered. A simulation, a representation of of an activity or environment, is a time-honored and effective teaching technique. A simulation can be a fun way to explore an environment or a concept that would be too expensive or possibly dangerous to handle in reality. For this reason, simulations have proven to be a fertile field for education software developers. A large variety of computerized simulations are available for classroom use in particularly every field. One collection of simulation games is iCivics, in which users assume different roles that explore different aspects of civic education. Sandra Day O'Connor, retired associate justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, founded iCivics. The simulations are available online and are organized by topical units so that they build upon one another. One game, Do I Have a Right, puts students in the role of running their own lawful firm. Students come to the firm with cases that may violate rights protected in the Bill of Rights. Assuming the role of an attorney, students work together to strategize the best way to help their clients. Simultaneously, students must manage the overall law firm. 
which entails tasks such as hiring new attorneys or helping existing lawyers learn new skills. Like many video games, these simulations have, learn have a learning curve. Virtual field trips provide a wealth of opportunities to extend learning. Not limited to social studies, virtual field trips can be used to provide information about a site that students are unable to visit. It is unlikely you will manage a class outing to the Amazon rainforest, for example, but National Geographic's Jason Project can send students on a field trip to the computer. Teachers, agencies, governments, and students themselves have produced hundreds of such sites. Students produced virtual field trips are often used in connection with local history. Students may, for example, conduct interviews and use phones or cameras to take pictures and videos of important sites and people in their community. By using photo editing software, they can manipulate these images or enhance them on the computer screen. Students can also put their images of local sites into multimedia presentation programs. These presentations can be published on the internet and viewed by others. In this way, students can act as historians who are contributing to the preservation of their community story. From slide rules to calculators, math teachers have relied on technology for years. This section deals with some of the newer uses of technology in math education. Tutorials are educational software applications designed to provide the initial instruction on a given topic. They are used in most disciplines. Unlike drill and practice exercises, tutorials present the scalar concept check for understanding throughout the process and reevaluate the learner's gra grasp of the topic once the program is complete. More narrative in nature than the drill and practice programs, tutorial software often has the feel of a book placed on a computer. Tutorial software is somewhat controversial because many tutorials are intended to replace the teacher as the primary agent of instruction for a particular topic. To achieve this goal, the software is self-contained and self-paced. Small chunks of information are delivered to learners in a careful sequence of instruction designed to adjust to students' needs, allowing them to achieve success. One such tutorial program is Streambox Learning. Students access the program online through their computer or handheld device. With this software, users move through concepts such as fractions and decimals at their own pace. Topics are explained, reinforced, and tested. The learner's progress through the material is saved from one session to the next. Generally more flexible than drill and practice applications, tutorials give teachers a powerful tool for individualizing instruction and monitoring student progress. And certain mathematics-specific software enhances what teachers can do. For example, the, ge uh, the geometer's sketchpad allows students to explore their relationship among points, lines, planes, and angles in an environment conductive to experimentation. Users are offered a palette of tools for drawing and delivering geometric concepts. Handheld devices enable students to go mobile when learning math. Sketch Explorer is one app that lets students take pictures with a tablet device to learn about angle measurement. These cognitive tools enable users to explore, question, learn, theorize, fail, succeed, and grow. Possibly the newest technology tools that are letting teachers teach in ways and possible before are 3D printers. The process of 3D printing is also known as desktop fabrication. Users design anything from a prosthetic hand to a piece of jewelry on a flat screen. The printer then generates layers to produce a 3D object. Math teachers are challenging students to apply what they have learned about mathematical model modeling or geometric functions to design and build all sorts of innovative creations. Schools are trying to heed the message inherent in the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics statements that electronic technologies, calculators, and computers are essential tools for learning, teaching, and doing mathematics. They furnish visual images of mathematical ideas, they facilitate organizing and analyzing data, and they compute e efficiently and accurately. These electronic technologies help teachers and students with some of these tasks that were conducted without these aids. Many students find it difficult to make connections among the graphical, numerical, and algebraic representations of mathematical functions. For example, the speed and ease with which graphs can be generated and manipulated using graphing calculators can help students to better understand those relationships. Experts state that once students have mastered the basic computation of a problem, they can use calculators to bypass this and move on to higher order concepts that they have not yet mastered. Other points, others point out that students who are struggling to develop the basic concept of, of a math problem can compensate for these skills when they use technology to gain access to the higher level skills. 
Technology also enhances what teachers and students are able to do. Students can use data collection devices connected to their calculators, such as various types of sensors or temperature probes, to gather their own data as the basis of, of their investigations into mathematical phenomena. Learning becomes more meaningful and authentic with these approaches, and students consult with both technology and teachers. The internet and other communication tools open up vast opportunities in foreign language education. Years ago, foreign language teachers struggled to collect current materials in the target language. Now students can view authentic materials over the internet or even use the internet to communicate with students in other classrooms in a foreign country. Compare assigning a sterile textbook article about French food to connecting your students with ePals in French-speaking Africa so they can ask about the cuisine themselves. The advantages of the latter approach are obvious. Foreign language students and English language learners can use a number of technology to develop their proficiency in English. Podcasts are of great value as correct pronunciation can be modeled through teacher-created podcasts and also practice as the students create their own podcasts. A number of free programs on the internet are very simple to create the podcast. Audacity is one such free program, providing a user-friendly interface with the option to convert to other file formats, such as MP3, which allows the recording to be played on other devices, such as an iPod or other MP3 players. As teachers are supporting their English language learners, they also need to follow the standard curriculum teaching math, science, and other subjects. This can be very difficult as students are trying to decipher the language while perhaps learning a new mathematical formula. Classrooms are not always equipped with a translator to support those students. A number of apps and programs on the market enable students to learn concepts in their own home language. Education City is one such program for students ages 3 to 12 and covers language arts, math, and science. The web-based program provides highly interactive games with visual and audible reinforcement. The math component and the curriculum content Text and audio can be fully presented in neutral Spanish if that option is chosen. This is very very useful as students can focus on mathematical understanding and not be obstructed by language barriers that may be inhibiting their learning. As we discussed earlier in this chapter, social media tools provide many opportunities for students and teachers to connect with others in disparate locations. Students can connect with speakers of other languages both through blogs, wikis, and other platforms. For example, Dickinson College hosts Mixer, a language exchange community. Mixer, Mixer allows language learners to find one another. A classroom of English speakers learning Spanish can be connected with a classroom of Spanish speakers using English. Individuals or groups from these classes then connect with tools such as Skype, a free downloadable active application that supports text, voice, and video chat. As they participate in the discussion, students put their communication skills to the test. These engaging ways of learning foreign languages are changing the way we teach, and they encourage learners to be creative and flexible and to take risks, all of which are indispensable to learning any new language. School district, districts vary greatly in location, size, budget, composition, of populations and graduation requirements. Such differences often create educational, educational inequities, particularly when a school district simply cannot afford to provide the quality and variety of courses offered by a larger or more affluent district. Virtual schools or online schools of courses offered, virtual schools or online schools are a flat, fast growing alternative for schools that are trying to overcome such constraints. Virtual school schools are playing an ever-increasing role in the education of students. 25 states offer online learning opportunities for students through virtual schools. Nearly 2, many, 2 million students take courses online. Most of these students are high school students taking credit recovery. Credit recovery students are individuals who must repeat a class to earn required course credit. The motivation for taking an online course for many students in rural areas is the opportunity to take a course otherwise unavailable. In Michigan, high school students are required to take an online course as a graduation requirement. Other states recommend taking an online course but do not require it. Full-time virtual schools are, are a growing phenomena. 29 states operate a full-time virtual school across the nation. Over 300,000 students are enrolled in a full-time online school. These schools represent one of the fastest growing options when it comes to school choice. Some students enrolled in these schools are homeschooled students. However, the majority of these students are enrolled in an online charter school. An emerging trend in virtual schooling is the growing number of private for nonprofit virtual schools. 
Technology tools can also assist with special needs. For students with learning disabilities, such tools can help level the playing field by presenting information in a matter best suited for the student's preferred learning style and unique needs. Although using a software program does not replicate the experience of learning from a teacher, the computer is not constrained by the human variables of limited patience and classroom distraction. Using the right software and alternative, an alternative individualized curriculum can be created for students with special needs paralleling the standard school curriculum. In addition to its direct instructional uses, technology plays a, a second very important role for students with special needs. Assistive technology describes the array of devices and services that help people with disabilities perform better in their daily lives. Students with disabilities may rely on a variety of innovations to help them achieve successful inclusion in regular classrooms. Computers are especially helpful in allowing students to participate in normal classroom activities that would otherwise be impossible. User-friendly keyboard enhancements simplify typing and assistive technology can be used to control most basic computer applications. Both Microsoft and Apple offer access features that enable users to select options such as visual prompts for the deaf or the ability to use a computer without a monitor for the blind. Eye and head tracking software is a revolutionary technology that opens up opportunities for students with special needs. Students with special needs can be can use a number of different programs and even apps to operate a computer or handheld device without hand movements. The program tasks the program tracks and records the user's eye or hand, head movements and pupil dilation across the computer display so that the system can be controlled with movement alone. This technology allows even extremely immobile students to communicate with teachers and classmates. Such applications allow users to do things like tilt their head and to scroll through a web page or flip the pages of an ebook. Eye movement can be used to conduct more fine tuned tasks such as drawing shapes. The variety of tools to help students with special needs fully participate in school is constantly expanding. One option includes a word prediction software that facilitates keyboarding. After the student types a letter or two, the computer presents a list of likely words that this, and the student simply selects the correct word rather than typing it out completely. Other aids, such as voice recognition software, which translates a student's spoken words into text on the computer screen, are programs that will read text aloud and can make writing a satisfying experience for students who struggle in this area. Blind students and their teachers can use Braille software, which provides easy-to-use, sophisticated print-to-Braille and Braille-to-print translations. Tablets and cell phones offer even more ways that technology can support students with special needs. Many of the tools we have discussed previously now fit in the hands of students and are, mo and are mobile with the students. Take, for example, a student with cerebral palsy who has limited verbal skills and can only type with a modified keyboard. That student can now use an app to record information on the go with his or her tablet. The mobility features a handheld, a handheld devices now enable technology to also support students with special needs such as attention deficit deficit hyperactivity disorder. Apps are available that help students to do things like set reminders, organize projects, or play concentration games. As we discussed in chapter three, who are today's students in a diverse society? A sort of technology must be considered a potential component of the individualized education program required under law for each child with a disability. Regular classrooms now offer now often include students with disabilities and other students with special needs, and you should be prepared to work with children who use assistive, assistive technology in your classroom. This process may be easier than you realize because many features developed for special needs users have been incorporated into general use software. As a teacher, you can expect that your students will have to meet some standards relating to technology. Some states give technology only a brief mention in their standards, whereas others have separate standards exclusively for technology. In line with the current nationwide move towards standards-based learning, the International Society of Technology and Education has produced national techno technology standards. For example, before completing 8th grade, students should design, develop, publish, and present products using technology resources that demonstrate and communicate curriculum concepts to audience inside and outside the classroom. ISTE encourages teachers to teach these skills within the context of their academic curriculum. To this end, ISTE has worked with content specialists to provide resources for incorporating the ISTE technology standards into subject standards for the rest of the curriculum. 
Although this trend is encouraging for technology to be truly integrated as an important part of the classroom instruction, current practices and attitudes must change in several other ways. The impact of technology on learning depends more on the ways in which teachers use technology than on the, on the characteristics of the technology itself. Integrating technology into your teaching can change the way you deliver content to your classes. Many schools and teachers have been slow to discover the true potential of new technologies, but some new trends are emerging. Technology can be more effective in a teaching environment where computers help to facilitate instruction and foster a constructive approach to learning as discussed in Chapter 9. As we have mentioned throughout this chapter, a constructivist approach to infusing technology is related to several other classroom characteristics, including the following. Teacher as facilitator. Think back to the scenario at the beginning of this chapter. Patricia Gonzalez was facilitating instruction as needed to bring a deeper understanding to the topic and their relevance to students. Because of the technology the students employed, she was no longer the sole source of information for her class. By using technology to present basic factual and historical information, the teacher is free to become much more involved in higher level evaluation of performance. Teachers can monitor students' projects, guiding their efforts, and providing feedback. Instead of being a teller and a tester, the teacher can be a leader and a co-learner. In such environments, teachers must view themselves as coaches or facilitators who guide students as they use technology to discover facts and concepts. Embedding technology in the curriculum with the encouragement of groups such as IST, the idea of teaching technology skills and isolation is giving way to a new model of embedding technology skills within the context of the content. For example, a social studies teacher might teach the mechanics of a problem such as voice thread as part of a unit on the local community that asks students to create a virtual field trip. In this model, the subject matter drives the technology rather than the reverse. In the words of one team of researchers, we learn best with technology rather than from it. Small group instruction to better use some technologies, teachers must move from whole class instruction towards smaller group projects and activities that are more conductive to active, engaged learning and student interactions. This shift is not one that all teachers warmly embrace. Smaller group work may mean that students learn different things at different times rather than an entire class learning the same material together. In many ways, this scenario resembles the days before chalkboards and full time and full class instruction. Classroom that effectively use technologies such as wikis and blogs may evolve into cooperative rather than competitive social structures, and student assessment should shift away from just pencil and paper testing and towards the evaluation of project products and progress in meeting established criteria under such models. Importance of formative assessment. In traditional teacher-centered instruction, teachers use formative assessments to monitor and redirect students under teachers. Understanding as the lesson unfolds. When teacher and technology, this feedback process becomes even more important. Teachers need to confirm teachers need to confirm not just student understanding of the concepts, but also their understanding of the technology tools they are using and the connection between the use of tools and the content learning goals of the lesson. Furthermore, because students' use of technology often requires critical thinking skills, teacher feedback during the working process can be a catalyst for students to achieve a deeper level level of understanding. The common connection, the connection between te- technology and constructivism, is not clear, but some researchers are beginning to understand certain elements of it. We know that teachers who have changed to a more constructivist approach in their classroom are the same teachers who have used computers consistently and in meaningful ways in their classrooms. These teachers are more willing to discuss subjects in which they are not experts and tend to assign longer, more complex projects. It appears that technology does not make teachers change, rather technology facilitates changes that teachers already want to make. Of course, change in education is really swift. Even highly motivated teachers who regularly use technology take a while to become comfortable with new technology and fit it into their classroom goals. Given the increasing pressure on schools to incorporate up-to-date technology and with other supporting factors present, such as sufficient funding and on-site technical support, we can expect to see changes in teachers' pedagogy as they become more comfortable with the power and the teaching opportunities technology provides. Florida's Project Child demonstrates some of the changes in common teaching practices and attitudes towards learning classrooms that help teachers effectively incorporate technology in teaching. In this program, elementary school teachers work together in teams of three clustered by grade level. Each teacher focuses on one of three subject areas, reading, writing, or math. 
After direct instruction from a teacher, students complete independent work while rotating through three stations, a computer station for technology work, a textbook station for paper and pencil work, and activity stations for hands-on work. The teacher also has a station for small group tutorials or individual assistant. The students rotate among the three subject area classrooms, working with the same three teachers for three years. This systematic approach ensures equitable computer time for all, and teachers can individualize instruction by, specific, by specifying where students begin working each day. Children of 10 work together to complete group projects and to have maximum computer time, learning from one another and from the computer and other materials in each room. Project T Child combines both traditional and constructivist views of instruction. Although teachers offer, offer some traditional direct instruction, one of the aims of the project is to help teachers shift from being a single source of knowledge in their classroom to being a facilitator and a coach. While students are using their station time, teachers circulate to facilitate learning. How effective is this program? Students participate in Project Child for a full three-year cycle, scored better on standardized tests than their peers in conventional classrooms with smaller computer-student ratios. These results suggest that an important variable is sim not simply how many computer students have access to, but rather how those computers are used. The teaching profession has been long known as an isolated profession. Often teachers enter their school building each morning greet a few colleagues, walk into their classrooms, and spend the rest of their day in the classroom with their students. One recent study found that teachers spend a mere 3% of the school day collaborating with other teachers. The surge of educational applications of social media are breaking down some of the isolating walls and providing teachers with creative ways of connecting with others outside of the classroom. Teachers use social media to collaborate with colleagues and with parents. Many teachers have replaced their re weekly printed newsletters with digital forms of communication of communicating with parents. Many teachers use blogs or Twitter feeds to share information with parents. There are many ways in which technology can now be used to keep your students' parents connected with what is happening in the room. Cell phones, emails, and websites are just a few of the technology being used in the schools, which are often welcomed by parents who do not have the time for many face-to-face -face meetings. These have the added bonus that they are much more likely to get directly into the hands of parents. Notebooks are often lost at the bottom of the book bags, especially if there is bad news. Many parents who want to know what is happening at school and websites provide a great way to post photographs, texts, and even videos to provide a window into your classroom community. School districts often provide class websites that can be easily manipulated through a template system. If you do not have access to a class website through the school, you can always take advantage of the many good free website options available, such as Google Sites. Edmodo is another free web, web resource teachers can gain a secure place for posting homework, grades, school notices, and other resources that ensures parents can follow what is happening in the, in the classroom. Technology can either be a hook to get parents involved or a quick deterrent to send them running. Parents who are not familiar with technology may be intimidated or feel, feel fearful of their child's computer use. Technology can become an obstacle between you and your student's parents. If you have a class website that gives pertinent information to parents, also ensure that you provide paper copies to those parents who do not have internet access. Social media networks are also exciting cognitive tools that can support student learning. One of the most power popular uses of social media tools in the classroom is to share student work. Teachers craft lessons that require students to upload assignments in a variety of digital formats, such as movies or podcasts. When crafting such assignments, teachers should be aware that not all students will have access to network computer at home. When this is the case, teachers should be sure that students are able to complete their assignment at a public library or community center. Some schools will open the computer labs before school hours or keep them open in the afternoon so that students can have supervised hands-on computer time to complete homework assignments. As with all uses of social media, teachers should be mindful of their professional and personal uses of social media. Unfortunately, the headlines are reporting more and more stories of teachers being fired for inappropriate uses of social media. Rather than avoid using social media, we suggest following guidelines for appropriate usage. A baseline guideline is to only share information online that you would share in the classroom. Facebook suggests five tips for teachers using Facebook and other social media platforms. Know your school's policy on using social media in the classroom and comply. Use public pages for your classes to post homework assignments and other updates. Use groups to control membership and facilitate discussion. Be a role model of a good online citizen. Report inappropriate content to Facebook. 
Computer technologies generally operate in several different arrangements within the school setting, and it is useful to think of these arrangements as a as ranging across a continuum from concentrated to infused, as shown in Figure 7.3. When technology is concentrated, students are given intense exposure to computers from time to time. Technology that is integrated smoothly into the daily classroom experience is described as infused. Several common computer setups ex exist along this continuum. Computer labs offer a concentrated arrangement in which all the students who use computers use computers at the same time. This setup is ideal for technology education, teaching about the computer or how to employ a particular application. In many labs, a large display station for the teacher facilitates the demonstration of skills for more effective whole class instruction. Labs may also feature specialized equipment such as interactive whiteboards. Most computer labs do not lend themselves to interdisciplinary or cooperative groups of group projects because of lack of open table space. Although some teachers foster collaboration by having two chairs around one computer, access to computer labs is another key factor in the use of in their use by teachers. In many classrooms, if many classrooms much must share a single computer facility, there may be little lab time for each class, and visits to the lab must always be planned. For these reasons, computer labs tend to foster technology education rather than what we might call education with technology. That is, education that uses technology to facilitate learning about other subjects. Computer labs do not always allow teachers to provide the best access to technology. There are other options that should be kept in mind. In a slightly more infused arrangement, a single computer classroom might have the computer that is kept on the teacher's desk or rolled in the room on a mobile cart. Until classrooms reach a one-to-one -one student computing device ratio, teachers will need to find instructional uses for one or just a handful of computers. Although a single computer makes it difficult to use the technology for active instructional tasks with the addition of a projection system, teachers can make the rich resources of the internet available for the entire class. For example, teachers might demonstrate complex mathematical or scientific concepts by using dynamic visualization programs such as the Drowner Sketchpad or Story Night. When used properly, this strategy can support student learning and inquiry. Unfortunately, projection systems are all too frequently mis misused, with students being subjected to endless and warning PowerPoint slides in darkened rooms where they become passive consumers of the digitally rendered information rather than active learners. In a more infused situation, a cluster of, is usually a table or an area of classroom where there's three to five computers are available for use at any time by the students in that class. Clusters provide convenient access to computer technologies for a variety of tasks. For example, a teacher might use two of the computers to allow cooperative group access to cognitive and communication tools and reserve the other computers for use as learning stations for specific subjects. Providing a cluster of computers in each classroom generally requires more of an investment in technology than the other arrangements we have described. A single computer lab of 25 computers can serve 10 classrooms, whereas the same number of classrooms might require 30 to 50 computers in a cluster arrangement. If a school can afford them, clusters are offer a very flexible use of technology in the classroom setting. Teachers can plan to use them in instruction and can set up each computer to fit their needs. Their arrangement generally fosters education with technology. It is not particularly good for technology education, however, because not every student has access to the technology simultaneously. Wireless laptop carts provide a good solution to issues of computer access in the classroom. This is a useful option as laptops are usually cheaper and take up less space than desktop computers, and there is not a wait time for the students to access the handful of computers the room may have. Some middle and high schools are moving to a policy of one laptop for every student, providing equitable access throughout the school. This arrangement facilitates deep, flexible use of technology by the students and encourages the teacher to assume the role of facilitator. Handheld computing devices such as an iPod Touch and smartphones offer the benefit of achieving a one-to-one -one ratio at a fraction of the cost of laptops. Tablet sales to the K-12 market exploded 340% between 2011 and 2012. They were expected to double again in 2013. The number of apps being developed for the K-12 market continues to grow exponentially, further expanding how teachers and students can use them in their classroom. You probably realize by now that many Features of education, educational technology have given a rise to serious debate among educators, policymakers, and the general public. To achieve the best of available technology, schools must, must reach some consistence, consistence on several key issues, including questions about infrastructure, budgeting, teacher education, parent support, 
equity gifts for students and how to infuse technology in the curriculum. Because of the excitement and demands generated by new technology, there is an increasing pressure to improve both the preparation of new teachers and the staff development options for in-service teachers. As teachers, we are constantly being told about new technology tools that will transform our teaching. These advices are more often than not accompanied with a set of detailed instructions for best practices and ways to apply the technology to our classroom. While we are always keeping our eyes and ears open for something groundbreaking and transformative, sometimes it can be difficult to decipher which tools would be most appropriate for our own classroom. There is a common misconception that educational technology has to look a certain way in order to be successful, but when I, what I have found is that the key to technology being successful in the classroom is that it is simple to use and that benefits both teachers and students. One piece of technology used correctly in the classroom setting can completely transform how you teach and how you, your students learn. I recently introduced my students to an innovative interactive timeline tool called ChronoZoom. ChronoZoom is a free online interactive innovative timeline tool that shows the history of the world starting with the creative creation of the universe all the way up to the modern day. When we typically think about timelines, most of us get a picture in our minds of a line with various events taking place one at a time. The beauty of ChronoZoom is that it is able to show how vast and complex history actually is in a way that allows students to shift through information and see the depth and scopes of history instantly. As soon as my students started using it, I saw light bulbs going off all over their heads as they started to understand how events of the past were shaped and influenced and that more than one event can happen at a single time. They were able to instantly understand and see big history. One of the most powerful aspects of ChronoZoom is that it allows students to become part of the content they are studying and breathe life into events and people of the past that they wouldn't normally be able to relate. Such a magical tool must be complicated and require copious amounts of technology. Right? Wrong. My classroom is a mobile unit with one classroom computer that is hooked up to a TV screen. If I feel like getting really fancy, I do have a projector. Many students were introduced to ChronoZoom in the beginning of the year as a way to show them the depth and scope of the history of the world. I told them they were going to become a part of the ChronoZoom Guild, and their main objective was going to be to find their own truths of the past using ChronoZoom as a way to gather and input information. I created timelines on ChronoZoom and put in information, graphics, and videos of the unit we were studying at that time, the Age of Exploration. I also used ChronoZoom as an assessment piece where students created their own timelines in order to show me that they understood what the age of exploration was and why it was a significant era. With limited classroom technology, I was able to implement ChronoZoom into my classroom successfully and was then able to watch as my students become more and more involved in whatever unit we were studying. ChronoZoom is an example of a technology tool transforming the way I teach and my students learn. Without this tool, timelines were a static line on a piece of paper. Now they are complex and interactive. Watching my students become captivated by content assisted by a piece of technology was such a rewarding and beautiful feeling that continued to transform and power my classroom forward. A mere 20 years ago, teachers' professional development typically meant teachers traveling out of their school building to attend a workshop or teachers gathering in the school media center listening to an outside guest speaker prevent present a professional development seminar. 20 years ago, when teachers wanted to explore curriculum resources, we typically checked out resources, resources from the school library or acted, asked a teacher down the hall for suggested resources. Technology has shaken up the way teachers engage in professional development and explore curriculum resources. Learn and See is one example of how teachers have changed the way they learn and collaborate with other professionals. Learn and See is an outreach initiative of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It is a website that hosts free resources for teachers and offers online professional development. Online professional development is offered through asynchronous courses and synchronous webinars. The course courses, the online courses cover a range of topics from using primary sources to teaching ESL students to how to teach online. Often a bundle of courses will run around a specific subject such as online teaching or American history. Subject area experts develop and teach these courses. Each course usually runs for four to six weeks. Teachers earn recertification credit for successful completion of the program. Teachers and even some non-teachers from all around the globe participate in these courses. Synchronous sessions are also offered in the form of webinars. These are open to educators across the globe for no charge. Typically, an expert will present on a topic such as common core math, grades K through five. Teachers want the presentation and 
submit questions through a chat room. The presenter views the questions in response to the entire audience. The webinars are recorded and saved and made available for anyone to watch at a later date. Learn and see its online collections have a vast <sighs> repository of text and multimedia. Highlights from the collection include virtual field trip and lesson plans for teaching environmental science, lesson plans for teaching about Native American Indians, and resources and guidelines for beginning teachers and their, mentor and their mentors. Learn NC regularly publishes blogs. The Well is a blog that shares relevant research and classroom teachers. Another one of the Learn NC blogs, Instructif Instructify, posts innovative ways of using cutting-edge technology in the classroom. This is just the tip of the iceberg to all of the lesson plans, guides, and curriculum resources that are available for no charge. Learn NC goes beyond publishing resources and offering courses by building a community of educators working together. Using social media platforms, Learn NC fosters an online community of educators who regularly sh share information and resources. Learn NC also supports ongoing initiatives by partnering with a variety of teachers to develop in innovative resources. When you graduate, you can count on having to demonstrate your skills in technology. In addition to national education technology standards for teachers, most states have included technology components as part of their licensure requirements. Schools for education, much like elementary and secondary schools, are grappling with the challenge of de developing competent teachers who will meet these goals. Many instructors indicate that even with the recent emphasis on computer literacy, instructional technology is not adequately modeled for future teachers. Schools of education are continually are continuing to rethink their programs and are gradually using modern technology to enhance what they offer. <sighs> to this end, education students often develop digital portfolios of their work, create ebooks to use with students, and use digital video to capture and reflect their student teaching. The University of Virginia's Curry School of Education operates the Technology Infused Project, which pairs each perspective pre-service teacher enrolled in the Teaching with Technology course with a local classroom teacher who has an interest in learning more about using technology in the classroom. During their collaboration, the classroom teacher provides insight into curriculum and classroom practices, while the pre-service teacher shares the new skills learned in the TIP program, such as use of app building tools or skills in constructive uses of technology. As teachers become more familiar with new technologies, they jointly explore instructional possibilities, accumulating in a long-term project that they teach together in the classroom. In this way, prospective teachers gain a valuable classroom perspective from veterans in the field and ground their technology learning in the classroom practice, and the classroom teachers gain professional development in technology. Whereas introducing technology into a classroom can be intimidating for some teachers, TIP's collaborative nature makes it more comfortable experience and provides an extra set of hands to assist with the process. Some states are adding more stringent technology requirements that teachers must meet to renew their license. Several states also offer incentives for teachers to develop technology skills, with the incentives ranging from paying for classes to buying hardware and software. Teachers report, however, that one of the greatest obstacles to their use of computers is lack of release time to learn how to use technology. Experts do not agree exactly how training should be offered. Some believe training should be an ongoing process that is at access at the teacher's convenience, whereas others advocate for an intensive off-site course with follow-up seminars to allow teachers a chance to learn without undivided attention. With the advent of widespread telecommunication networks, many professional development courses are now at night or during the summer to work through synchrotrons and asynchronous professional development. Students who use a computer at home have opportunities to develop skills and explore technology's potential that are not available to students without these resources. T students with internet access from home and particularly broadband access may have opportunities that others do not. Although the divide is closing between those with internet access and those without, there is still a large discrepancy between the two. In 2013, 85% of adults reported using the internet. The majority of adults who do not access the internet report not using it because it is not relevant to them or it is too difficult to use. Only 7% of adults not accessing, not accessing the internet report a physical disability or lack of internet access as the reason they are not online. However, simple access is not the only barrier. One technology expert argues that students from poorer families are more likely to use computers for games, whereas children from middle-class families are more likely to use the computer for online research. Access to broadband internet connectivity is also a determining factor in how individuals use the internet. 98% of homes have access to broadband connections, yet only 69% of these households use broadband services. Affordability remains the determining factor for whether households have high-speed connections. 
Some critics also argue that current patterns in technology of technology used in schools contribute to disparities in educational quality. At school, data indicate that poor students are at a disadvantage, although the presence of computers in schools is Although the presence of computers at school in wealthier and poor areas has almost equalized, the digital, the digital divide still exists in terms of quality of equipment and type of instruction. For example, underprivileged children are more likely to use computers in a rigid drone practice format rather than in a more flexible format, such as doing online research that build higher level cognitive skills. There are models of teachers and community members using technology to break down the digital divide. One example is the Erman TXT program based out of Los Angeles, California. This after-school program is designed to provide technology access to inner, inner, to inner city male teenagers and to support their development as community and technology leader. The program is geared not only to keep at-risk students from dropping out of school, but also to equip them with skills that will help support their ability to become leaders in the field of technology. Students gain programming skills to develop websites and apps. One 15-year-old who participated in the program said that because of his experience in the program, he sees himself as a technology pioneer and has set high academic goals for himself. Technology access and use divides along racial as well as income lines. In 2013, the U.S. Census Bureau reported that there are still disparities across racial lines when it comes to access and use of technology. The report states that Asian households are the most likely to use the internet at home. They are followed by white households, Hispanic households, and black households. As we discussed earlier in the chapter, cell phones are changing the landscape of communication and access to information. African Americans and English-speaking Latinos are as likely as whites to own and use a cell phone. In fact, they are more likely to use their phones for a greater variety of tasks than whites. Gender differences also are a factor in the effective use of technology in education. Researchers argue that certain types of technologies aggravate the differences between boys and girls. For example, many commonly used apps value speed, aggression, and efficiency, qualities that boys tend to display. For girls, technology appears to be more interesting when it's used for a relevant problem-solving exercise or collaboration rather than as an end in itself. Blogging is one example of a technology that girls have adapted more rapidly than boys. The key to engaging girls in technology appears to be how technology is used in the classroom. Tasks that require versatility and collaboration in classrooms that move to a more integrated approach to technology may invite more girls to participate. Teachers can take steps to dispel technology-related inequities within their own classrooms. For example, students with little computer experience can be teamed with more experienced users. Classroom and computer labs can be made available to students before and after school, and teachers can promote gender equality through modeling attitude and expectations. Technology need not become a wedge widening the gap between the haves and the have-nots, but without awareness of the problem, the potential for increased inequality is very real. For computer technology to become a genuine part of school life, it has in the business world, the tools of technology must be integrated into school behaviors. Integrating technology means bringing the tools of technology into learning and teaching activities, just as teachers already do with chalkboards and books. This is not an easy task. Much of this chapter is focused on how computer technologies can be used as tools for student learning, but we have also seen that many support systems must be in place. Which conditions must be present in a school to create learning environments conductive to powerful uses of technology? Among other conditions, school must ha schools must have the following. Student-centered approaches to learning, access to contemporary technology, software, and communication networks. Educators skilled in the use of technology for learning. Technical assistance for maintaining and using technology resources. Ongoing financial support for sustained technology use. Content standards and curriculum resources. Community partners who provide expertise, support, and real-life interactions. Visions Vision with support and proactive leadership from the education system, assessment of the effectiveness of technology for learning. As this list indicates, real change in education and technology cannot be the job of a lone teacher who is a whiz on the internet or a single school board member who votes for new software. It must be a systemic change coming from a critical mass of individuals who are committed to the integration of education with technology. End of chapter 7.